they might not remember my name, but they will always remember that lady that is big different than everybody else. Part of it is just finding those pieces of you that make you unique. That could be your biggest strength and also your biggest challenge. You're listening to the Speak With Presence podcast. I'm Jen Valenga, here with my co-host, Jennifer Retley Thomas. I'm JRT, and we're the co-founders of Voice First World. This podcast seeks to answer one question. What's stopping women from speaking up? We want women to speak with confidence in all their spheres of influence. Our guests share their stories and offer advice on speaking with presence without being perfect. If you are new here, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. If you've heard our story, skip ahead about a minute to get right into the episode. A decade ago, JRT and I were brought together to build creative university events. A professor of theater, I took on story development, script writing, and speaker coaching. An AVP of development, JRT was the genius behind operations, and she always showed up with a striking leadership presence. We loved working together. We laughed a lot, but we started to notice a world of difference. So many women speakers showed up prepared as perfectionists, but not always confident in their delivery. When the pandemic hit, we all went to audio and video, where perfection is a challenge. Women muted themselves, turned off their cameras, stopped being heard. We wanted to do something. We know inequity in the workplace is systemic and not the fault of women, but together we'd gotten great results empowering and coaching them to speak with presence. It's one of the solutions to getting more women into higher levels of leadership and influence. We left our careers in higher ed to launch Voice First World, a coaching company located at the intersection of public speaking and leadership presence. Our purpose is to advance women in the workplace. If you want to know how you can speak with confidence in all your spheres of influence without being perfect, subscribe to our podcast. I want to do a shout out, Jen, to Dr. Mary Gwinden, your mom, who we interviewed a couple of weeks ago for making the connection with our powerful speaker today, Dr. Rebecca Chow. I know Jen has known her a little bit longer. I had the opportunity to meet her probably in the fall. When I walked in the room in Kansas City, there was this energy that just radiated from her. I want to give our listeners a little bit of a background about who she is. So Dr. Rebecca Chow is a bilingual licensed clinical professional counselor in Missouri and Kansas. And the thing that I love about her that I hope she'll talk to us more about today is that she's a registered play therapist supervisor. And Dr. Chow is actively involved in the counseling and play therapy community with topics related to mental health, neurobiology, diversity and inclusion, parenting, supervision, and technology. And she is a consultant for the Kansas Division of Family Services, and hold on for just a second as I say this, and Sesame Street in Communities. Sesame Street in Communities. Big Bird and Mr. Stephalopagus, I love you. And in addition, she is serving in the association, is serving on the Association for Play Therapy Boards of Directors. So with that, Jen, there was a lot to say, and I really want to talk about Sesame Street. And I'm going to transition it back to you for just a minute. Okay. Today, I would like to share a quote about Dr. Rebecca Chow from another woman. Dr. Rebecca Chow is one of those people you want to surround yourself with and absorb her knowledge and skills. I first heard of Dr. Chow due to her work in play therapy and trauma. Needless to say, I was elated when I found out she was going to be my professor for a counselor education and supervision PhD course. Needless to say, her reputation precedes her, and I quickly learned why Dr. Rebecca Chow is highly respected and deeply loved. She is knowledgeable, compassionate, and helps others be their best selves. One evening during class, she shared a phrase that impacted my life and has been my mantra ever since. Good enough is good enough. Dr. Rebecca Chow is truly a remarkable human, and the contributions she has made and continues to make in the counseling field are exceptional. If you ever get the opportunity to attend one of her presentations, do it. And this is from Cassie Wetzel. 
Man, I got to live up to the hype now. <laughs> you do live up to the hype. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Welcome. Well, before we dive in, can you just give, because I have been talking to some of my friends about you, but I love your work in play therapy. Can you give a little bit of background about what that is? Absolutely. I am originally from Costa Rica. So I moved to this country about 25 years ago to do my master's in counseling. And after finish, I, after I finished that, I went right into working with clients. And then I realized, hmm, I don't look like the rest of the counselors. I don't sound like the rest of the counselors. And I am a baby therapist, right? <laughs> and as I was doing that, I was trying to figure out how do I find something where culture, language, age, is not the center of that. Mm. Because even though I have embraced now who I am and I have learned to love this accent, 25 years ago, I wanted to lose it. And I stumbled into play therapy. So play therapy is a therapeutic framework that we utilize to work with uh, people from different ages, from zero years old to 105 years old. What you do is you use different type of experiential uh, materials like toys, sand, art, and you utilize it in a way that you can communicate and express things that sometimes verbally you can't, right? Like when we think about our past and sometimes talking about our childhood or even right now as parents, verbalizing sometimes that... Uh, you know, we don't really like something about our lives. Or when we are at the office, we think, ah, oh, this person is just driving me crazy. Sometimes even verbalizing that can be so hard. But if we sit down and I bring some of the miniatures and I tell you, show me a picture of what is going on in the office. Mm. Show me a picture of what is going on with your team. And you grab all of these materials, they all of a sudden become alive. Our mind, our brain is so magical that sometimes toys can provide that way of communication where we can bring something from the past or something that we're struggling and it can make it more manageable. So that's how I stumbled into play therapy. I got connected with the Association for Play Therapy and that was really what shifted uh, my clinical work, just knowing that there was something that did not need to be spoken about, but that brought us together. Play is universal. Dr. Chow, when you, so I know creative arts therapies, which is the mm -hmm. umbrella yeah. for therapy that deals in the mm -hmm. arts, because, you know, I worked with Sally Bailey, who is an incredible drama therapist. Oh, she's phenomenal. Yes. So when you think about drama therapy, that's about how you act out certain things. Or oftentimes it's puppets. You know, there's lots of films yeah. that show people with puppets that can say things that the person can't. But is play therapy, drama therapy closely aligned with music therapy, art therapy? Are they all under the umbrella creative arts therapies? Mm, absolutely. And what happens with that is all of these mediums really connect with the uniqueness of the person, right? So there is a power that comes with play that we, when we grow up, we kind of lose it, right? So when we grow up, most of us don't play anymore. I have never had a chance when I'm working with an adult and I bring a, a packet of crayons when they open it and they go like, you know, oh. and they smell the crayons. And we know now, especially with all of the research that is coming up about brain and connection and how do we regulate ourselves so that we can be more present in our daily lives, that anything related to the senses senses bring us back to something regulating every time I work with an adult and I say we're going to be working with crayons or play-doh today they all look at me and go like really and then as soon as they open I can see their face just light up they they smell the crayons and they're just like I don't remember when was the last time I you know I color and they start doing the activity and the more that we do the more that we talk the more that they connect and then all of a sudden you realize you're talking about something you didn't even know you wanted to do so that's what play music drama all of those experiential activities that you put together with a person really connects with that that was the way that we started communicating with the world right? Before we talk, before we do anything, music, 
uh, connection, being able to share our stories even without words, was the basics of communication. So I, that's what I love it. Plus, there is very no time. If you think about when you feel like you're not grounded, which means you don't feel like you are at the top of your game, mm -hmm. it's truly because you're either in the future, which you cannot control, or you're in the past, which, again, once it happened, it already happens. And uh, play, music, Connecting with each other brings us extremely into the present, which is what we can truly control. That's beautiful. That's amazing. You are so amazing. Can you tell us the story of a time when you felt like a very powerful speaker against all odds? There has been certain times in my life. And I think as we think about when we had to speak up or speak with presence, there is certain times in our life when those moments are... I. I call them our magical moments when we really just use our voice to really take us to the next level. But it really depended when you were developmentally. Right. Mm -hmm. So like I said, about 25 years ago, I moved to this country with the idea that I wanted to work on my master's degree. And when I first came here, I was with a host family. And I remember I was talking to them and I told them, you know, I like to do my master's degree here. And they look at me and well, not really, but pretty much they <laughs> laugh at my face and Aww. told me, oh, how are you going to do a master's degree in this country? I mean, I did came from a, a comfortable life in Costa Rica, but not enough to, you know, finance a master's degree in the States. And I said, well, I just want to do it. And then they're like, there is no way to stay here. I was here just for six months. I was going to a community college for an English as a second language courses. I already knew English, but that was helping me out. And um, so one of the days that we were supposed to go and buy the ticket, because you did not buy the tickets online 25 no, years no, ago. No, ma'am. Drove yourself to the airport to buy the ticket in the, you know, in the kiosk. And that day there was a, a storm coming up, so we couldn't um, we couldn't really uh, go. And I remember taking this this very bundle of paper that I have in my pocket, and I told this uh, my host uh, family uh, person, "Can you take me to this university? I have this name." So he's like, "No, we already told you." you need to go back and I said please 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 so I after begging to him he takes me over there to make the story short I landed into this guy's office and I am talking with lots of energy telling this is what I want to do this is my dream after I talk for 30 minutes and I finally have to catch my breath this guy saw his opportunity to really talk to me and, you know, insert himself in the conversation. And then he's like, how did you get to my office? And I'm like, ah, duh, I want to study counseling. And then he's like, I don't know if you know who I am, but I am the dean of the university. Now, an interesting thing about this is dean to me could have been somebody that just, I mean, anybody in the office. I had no idea. I did kind of get an idea that he maybe was somebody because he had gone from red to purple and I could see the face of shame that he had. Also wondering, how did we get here? You know what? I don't know why somebody gave me his office number. I don't know why somebody gave me his name. And also, I don't know where was all of the administrative assistance of all of the offices that I went through before I landed there. Maybe they were in the tornado warning and I had absolutely no idea. Anywho. To make this story short, after I share with him my story, he is like, I typically don't do this, but uh, I love your story and I'm going to help you. So he walked me to the international student's office. And after I went there, um, the, the, the people thought I was friends with the dean. <gasps> And because I had good grades and my bachelor's in psychology, they they helped me out. So after a month, I got, um, a, a, you know, I, I got a scholarship to be an international student uh, and I could move here to UMKC. And then I went to UMKC, got my master's. I work at the library. It covered all of my international fees. And then I worked the rest of the money I had to come up. I work at the library for $3.50, and it was an amazing experience. 
But fast forward in that, right? So at that point, I am brand new from Costa Rica. I just had this amazing dream. This is what I wanted to do. I wanted to move here because I wanted to get my doctorate. And then little by little, I I didn't really know what I had. I didn't really even know who I was. I just had this dream. Then halfway through my program, I met my husband who grew up over here, but is originally from Hong Kong, right? But then that's why I have a Chinese last name. <laughs> and people are expecting, expecting a Chinese person and then they go like, surprise, <laughs> right? And that has been my journey through finding my voice. So fast forward 20 something years, and then I finally get my doctorate. And I remember when I go, I got my doctorate from K-State. I remember the first time, the first night when we're introducing ourselves. And again, I mean, throughout my life, I have always had a voice, but I didn't know I had it, right? And part of it is because of all of this, right? When I show up, I show up and I, I be in Costa Rica and you can pretty much achieve anything you love. It is intrinsic into our, our DNA. But I remember the first time I introduced myself and I did this whole thing. And then another one of my classmates introduced themselves and they said they were going for a PhD. For me, it was just a personal goal. I always saw myself as being, well, Dr. Chow now. But I remember her saying that she needed a PhD to have a place in the table. And that to me was the strangest thing. Why will you need a, a degree to have a place in the table? And that's when I realized, oh, what? I mean, can you just show up to places and they say, hey, this is who I am and it's so amazing and come join me, right? Through that process of getting my PhD, I start also finding my voice. I start really understanding, oh man, I have this. And this is different than everybody else in this program. And then graduation happened. And then that's really when it hit me. Because I was doing this presentation at the, conf at the Association for Play Therapy Conference. And after I did this, um, this presentation on supervision and, and play therapy and incorporating that, there was this lady from South Africa that came over. And she said, will you be, I have never heard anybody that sounded or looked like you that was presentations in a conference like this. And we need more people like you in leadership. People that sound like you, people that look like you, people that have this thing about you. Like you think like you present yourself as so common and the same as everybody else, but you are not. And I remember listening to that lady and she said, after she said that, and she said, we need more people representing yourself. I remember five years ago and having that conversation and thinking, oh, okay, so people look at me like this and this means something different to people than to me. See, to me, I'm just Costa Rican. And now, well, I'm not even from there, not from here. So I am Costa Rican and Kansan. And I remember, okay, so if I have no fear, because I didn't grow up here and I think I am this, and it sounds like I have a voice, then I'm going to apply to be in the, uh, at the APT board, the Association for Play Therapy board, because I need to represent this lady. I need to represent everybody else that looks and sounds like me or that have a parent that looks and sounds like me. And regardless of how I feel, I can be that. And that was truly when I really found my voice, right? That was truly when all of this came together. My accent, the way that I look, my name becoming a doctor child, uh, being, the, being a mom, being able to dream what my professional life and being a mom was without feeling like I had to be, um, <laughs> I have to sacrifice either one of them. But it's also probably for what that quote that you read, because I have always believed that sometimes you can be epic and be at the top of your game. And sometimes you do have to make the choice to be just good enough. 
Yes. So as you were reading that quote, I'm like, oh, I can see myself saying that because sometimes I have been amazing at work or at presenting or at collaborating and I have not been as amazing as a mom, but I had been good enough. And sometimes because I am a mom, I had had to, you know, to find a balance between not being epic at what I'm presenting or what I'm working at, but I am good enough. And being able to really understand that and giving yourself the uh, the permission, not from the outside, but to yourself of really understand this is okay for now. This is good for now. Can it be epic? Yes. Can it be epic right now? No. Right? And being able to understand that that's okay. It has been, and of course, there is other times in my life, but we don't have enough time to go over that. But I think the beginning of my voice to that moment when I realized, okay, this is it. This is your next next purpose has been really a life changing for me. It has changed how I view myself. It has changed how I speak to people. It has changed uh, the way that I collaborate even outside of that, of my everyday job. I remember you saying it's all about knowing what your secret sauce is. Yes. And I think you've really found your secret sauce. Yes. I also think there is this process of understanding. So I think each of us have this unique superpower, right? Or the secret Mm -hmm. sauce, like I like to call it. And I think it takes a little bit to really find what the right combination of things are. I remember when I first started uh, doing the presentations and the stuff, people will come to the presentation. But when I get really super excited, I talk really loud (laughs) and, you know, I feel the room and I talk really fast. And then what happens when you have an accent or any other type of, you know, if you're anxious to speak in front of a group is... As soon as as you get that excitement that comes with the people, but also with the topic you're talking about, some of the things that are maybe, I don't like calling it weaknesses, but maybe it's not the best of yourself, just get worse, right? And I I remember getting a stop halfway through presentation, somebody will lift their hand, mostly men, I have to admit, (laughs) you know, they will, and then they will say, can you please, um, I am happy. This is my worst nightmare. And you can see because now I'm all dysregulated inside. <laughs> I'm having a hard time understanding what you're saying. And then immediately I can just feel, even just talking about this, right? I feel my heart rate racing. I feel my hands getting sweaty. I'm trying to think how did he specifically say it? Because as soon as somebody says that, you become very self-conscious. Mm-hmm. And as soon as, and then you have a full full room of people and then I can, so it took me a little bit to really understand when did I needed to pause? How did I needed to speak? What were the things that I needed to do to bring myself into the present? And I do that a lot with sensory stuff, right? right? Like maybe putting some lotion in my hand before the presentation and breathing in or even when my rings you know even turning around my you know my wedding ring and as I am talking really you know touching the, the ring feels uncomfortable when you turn it around but something as simple as that that can really remind you you're still epic but probably slow down a little bit right <laughs> it was that moment now that didn't happen at that moment he said that to me and I felt like I was crushing right And then I stop myself and I breath, breathe. But I have always been able to understand that that uniqueness that I have, you know, it's also what makes me special. So I say, oh, thank you for pointing that out. (laughs) I know when I get really excited, I talk really, really fast. So (sighs) let me breathe and try to slow down myself. But I am going to be honest, halfway through this presentation, I'm going to get already so pumped. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm going to lose track of my uh, my calmness. And then, but I, you know what? The cool thing about you raising your hand is I'm going to look at you and then I'm going to think, don't forget to slow down. And I think that's the, another piece of me understanding and embracing my own presence and how I speak up is even those moments where they can be crushing, utilize those as an 
opportunity for turning things around. That guy really helped me because when he's he said that, of course, I was devastated. But then on the other hand, every time I see him, it was like that grounded moment of <laughs> you going down. <laughs> Are you really pacing yourself? Are you maybe not joking as much so that you can really, you know, so that people can catch up with what you're doing? And I think that has been a piece of me understanding. I did want it to lose my accent for the longest mm -hmm. time. And I think that, you know, for me is my accent, but for every woman out there, there is something about yourself that you wish, oh, I wish I didn't have this. I mean, we're all humans. It is part of us thinking that the grass is greener on the other side. I think part of it is really understanding, is this really a deal breaker? Or could this be your superpower? Right. Maybe this stuttering or the fact that your hands get really sweaty when you're in a meeting and you have to shake somebody's hand. Uh, can that be really your superpower? And use that as a moment of, well, that does make you stand out. There is no place I do show up when people do not remember. They might not remember my name. It is hard because, I mean, this mix that I was just telling you about, but they might not remember my name, but they will always remember that lady that is big different than everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. Or they will always remember that lady that had the big smile, right? And I think part of it is just finding those pieces of you that make you unique, that could be your biggest strength and also your biggest challenge. It's all about embracing them perspective. It's a it's a beautiful amount of self awareness that you displayed, especially in speaking back mm -hmm. to that gentleman. That takes a lot of bravery to say, "Yes, thank you." I I do acknowledge it. And we talk about name it, name what's happening in the room. Yes. Really, just name it. That way, you can address it. Because of the work that you do, you do work with a lot of men and women. But I know you work with a large co cohort of women. Mm -hmm. What do you think is getting in the way of other women speaking up and finding their, as I'm just looking at, you know, the deal breaker versus a superpower. What's keeping women from identifying their superpower? You know, I think a lot of the times it has been my experience, not in my professional life, but also in my personal life is there is something about the way that we present ourselves. And I think it could be a cultural thing too, but I think women, we like to present ourselves as we are at the top of our game all the time. And the expectation that we have for our for ourselves, it's so unachievable that then that expectation we have for ourselves just crushes us. And then not only that, but a lot of the times we're so focused outward Unless you are in a situation like I am, like I have never been able to meet somebody like me that is in the field that I am. You know, if I think about all of the grades of play therapy, all of the grades of counseling, they all were males. Uh, well, the majority of them, I cannot say all of them, the majority of them were males. Um, a lot of them really uh, were from the, this country. Uh, they used to do therapy in a different way that I did, but I love where they were coming from. I love what they were implementing. So I have always put myself in a way where learn from those people that are different than you, but don't set your expectation to be like those people because you can't. It was sometimes we have to learn for the, from the purist, right? Sometimes you do not need to learn from those people that are doing something either in business or if you are practicing law or if, if you're a doctor or you are a CEO. In all of those times, there is a, a role model that you're learning from or somebody that you're grabbing the stuff and you're just soaking it all in after you have really embraced and learned all of that is what is your twist to that see because that is the key to this what makes something powerful is not you recreating there is somebody there is somebody out there already that is great at this they were the first is how can you give it your own twist because your uniqueness is what can make something powerful. Your genuineness 
So I cannot tell you how many times I have show up into a place that was bigger than me <laughs> and that with other people that were more knowledgeable, had more experience, have no accent, have no uh, more degrees or more certifications than me. Also the opposite, right? <laughs> because yes. you show up there, so with somebody who has more and less than you. But when I show up in there, genuineness was the key. Being able to set up achievable expectations to, okay, so with my background and with who I am, showing up always and not going into these rabbit holes or sharing a story is very hard for me. (laughs) Because when I am talking to people, I can always relate to something (laughs) that is related to my own vulnerability. So then what I do is instead of thinking I'm going to show up and I am really going to focus and I'm only going to be professional and I'm only going to be talking about neurobiology and all of these different parts of the brain, the way that so-and-so speaks up, it's impossible because (laughs) when I'm talking about neurobiology, I'm going to be talking about this is what happened to me when I was in the car with my 15-year-old this morning. That genuine moment on setting an expectation Just don't talk too many about examples, right? Don't go into too many stories, but make it relatable. That's an achievable goal. Showing up and taking away that piece of me, it's impossible because that's what makes me unique. (laughs) I'm able to talk about the brain and all of these pieces with my own pronunciation (laughs) of the brain, different parts of the brain. And make it relatable to people so that a three-year-old can understand it, a 15-year-old can understand it, and somebody with their doctorate can understand it. You're right? speaking JRT's language in the pronunciation <laughs> world, giving you a big, fat heart. Love language. <laughs> Love language. We all have, you know, that's the thing about this is, and this is another thing for women too, is I feel like if we all could find that person that you can truly be genuine and vulnerable, that this has to be the right person, right? I have those people in my life in my different areas. So I have somebody in my personal life where I can truly be vulnerable. I have somebody that I have professionally where I can truly be vulnerable. I have friends, um, personal friends where I can be vulnerable about feeling that I'm not, you know, I'm having troubles as a wife or I'm having trouble as a mom. I have people in my work that I can be vulnerable with, that are those people that it's okay to be vulnerable with. And sometimes the power that comes with saying, man, I am not good today. This is what I did to my nine-year-old today. And I feel like crap. And that other person that has a nine-year-old turns around and looks at you who are supposed to have it all together and said like, oh my gosh, does this happen to you too? And I go like, ah, all the time. And then you can see people just going, now, can I do this all the time? Absolutely not, right? In a board meeting, there is certain things when I had been there that I have to really, that's not the time to be crying about, you know, what just happened with my 15-year-old. But finding other women around your tribe that can also say, I experienced this too. Because then it makes you realize Other people are struggling. And all of a sudden, it creates that sense of we are all on this together. You're saying what I haven't maybe been able to articulate yet myself. So thank you for that. Which is, there's this moment of um, putting vulnerability up on a pedestal. We all need to be vulnerable all the time. And and I don't think there's enough said about, no, not all the time. (laughs) We don't need to be in a boardroom talking about you know, I don't know if your young mom breast milk leakage, and that is just the structure of business. That's not about a male dominated profession. If it was all women, I still think there's, uh, there's a goal for that meeting and it doesn't include your side notes, but I, I love that you, you also qualified by saying not all the time. That example about the breast milk is a great example, because you can be in the board meeting and then knowing that that's not going to be the, the place that you're going to be talking about that because there is a goal, there is already an agenda set up and and you have prepared for that meeting. Yes. Did you prepare at that meeting at 
from three o'clock to four o'clock in the morning, you know, putting the final touches because that's when you got woken up for that night feeding. And yes, would you wish you had a full night of sleep and you didn't? Absolutely. So, but the key over here is the shame that comes with that. And a lot of the times, sometimes it can come from outside, but sometimes the guilt and shame come from inside. And you don't have to feel like you have to explain it. No. That's the key of all this. It's like I feel because we have high expectations for ourselves as professional women and also at home, we feel like we have to explain this. I mean, sometimes you do explain things like, for example, there's been times when I'm doing these presentations and I have a, a private place when the kids know that I am up here, they're supposed to be doing their own thing. But there has been meetings when I am doing this and then I see this little nine-year-old doing this thing in the background because he's like flat on the ground, fully almost naked, just with these tight little boxers that one day I'm going to miss when he's a grown-up. And he's doing this thing in his belly because he forgot something over here in this room sometimes I have ignored it right because I'm like I'm in the midst of making a point and then I'm not gonna deviate from you sometimes I had said you guys can tell something is going down back there David just grab whatever you need we can see you and then he pops right up and I said that's my son David right and he's on the way how do we get back to the point right which is now, as you guys can see, I'm totally cool, unexpected, but cool. It gave us a brain break. Let's go back, right? Because everybody's laughing at this point. So let's use it to our advantage. In other situations, I was in the middle of something that cannot be stopped to be talking about my nine-year-old half-naked in underwear because it just misses up the flow. Yep. That doesn't mean that I did yell at David in those situations and went downstairs. What are you doing up there? The door was closed. <laughs> and he's like, Mommy, I really needed that marker. It's an important marker. So that would be a parenting moment where the first thing that you want to say is like, seriously, you needed that marker. You didn't have a million here. But sometimes I'm able to stop myself and understand, okay, David, you did need that marker. And that was special enough to you for us to go through this. Yes. I will remember this one day. I <laughs> will. And it's going to be funny. Not today, but one day. It will one be day funny. it will be funny. You're full of so much wisdom. What do you see as the solution for women who want to speak more powerfully? I think the first thing for me through this whole process have been able to give yourself the space to understand that your voice will change according to your development. You know, if you're brand new into your career, you just graduated and then you're trying to find your professional voice, understand that you're going to do that right now. You're going to do that after you decide to, if you decide to get married or have a family, your voice will change and then your kids will grow up and then your voice will change again. Mm -hmm. And I think is being able to give ourselves the space to understand that our voice changes according to some of the life uh, challenges or blessings that we get. Very seldom you are in situations when you can look back and you can say, oh my gosh, that was perfect. We can always look back and say, oh man, if I have known this, I would have done that and that would have been even better. But the reality of it is, even through that journey, we have learned. Giving yourself pockets of time when you can breathe and be vulnerable with a safe person that will not only listen to you, will be honest, but will be good enough to hear you and give you some feedback without totally destroying you. Being very picky about those people is important. This has been amazing. You, we didn't even get into Sesame Street and communities, which is such an important thing to talk about. Next time. Next time. Yes. Number two. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. We are grateful for you being here. I know you're going to make an impact on a lot of women's lives. Thank you so much. Well, bye everyone. Thanks for listening to today's show. A brand new episode releases every Tuesday. If you like what you've heard and you're interested in seeing if it's a good fit for us to work together, here's what to do. 
Go to voicefirstworld.com forward slash apply to book a free call. We'll get on the phone for about 45 minutes to get you clear on three things. What's stopping you from speaking up? Who needs you to speak with confidence in your spheres of influence? And how you can speak with presence to advance your career. School didn't prepare us for a voice first world. The less you speak, the more you fall behind. But you don't have to be perfect. And we can help. We've helped women across industries own their expertise, articulate their worth, and share their stories for the digital age. To see if we can help you, head over to voicefirstworld.com forward slash apply. I'm Jen V. And I'm JRT. Let's talk soon. Drum roll, Dr. Rebecca Chow. We're done. Bye, everyone. Have a great week.